Pastor Dr. Reginald Van Stevens. What does it mean to persevere? If I'm calling on you, if I'm encouraging you to persevere, what does it mean to persevere? How is it possible to persevere in the faith given what we have to be faced with today? And all of us are faced with something. All of us are, are tempted by something. All of us, are, 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 the devil is trying to discourage us with something to get us to fall away from the faith. But how is it possible to do it? Regardless of whether you have ongoing hardships or the devil trying to pull you in a different direction or by worldly standards you're comfortable and you honestly have gotten successful because you know there are all kinds of distractions. But how can I persevere, Pastor? First thing you got to be is determined to follow Christ. Don't ever estimate determination. Hold to your Christian convictions. You can do it. The devil says you can't, but yes, you can. You can hold to your Christian convictions despite all of the other kinds of things that are designed to discourage you. Even when Jesus was on earth in the flesh, there were some who were first excited about being his disciples, who eventually decided to distance themselves or fall away from him. Why? Because of the requirements of his words. Let me give you one good example. In John 6, he says, if you won't follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They said, oh. They didn't remain long enough to learn what he meant with his metaphorical expression. He was talking about or teaching about how to have real life and be sustained in this life's journey. They were just finishing up a talk, if you go back and read John 6, about the manna that God sent down from heaven to get his people through the wilderness. You got to keep stuff in context. Some people fall away from the faith because they don't stay long, around long enough to find out what you're really talking about, what is really behind it. They take things out of context. And when it's taken out of context, the devil can mess you up. How many people you know have left the church because something they taken out of its context, its proper context? And, they, and the devil got you just like that. Today, a few fall away because they don't understand completely what they are hearing as simply requirements of the faith. They don't stay long enough to learn what they don't immediately understand because they don't allow the word of God to become deeply rooted in themselves. If you want to stay, you got to be determined. If you want to persevere, you got to be convicted and convinced. Welcome to the White Rock Baptist Church Worship Experience. Led by our dynamic pastor, the Reverend Dr. Reginald Van Stevens, we invite you to join us each and every Sunday as we welcome the world to Christ. If you're in Durham, North Carolina, we'd love to have you join us in person on Sundays at 9.15 a.m. for a wonderful time in worship and in the Word. At White Rock, we believe that families are strengthened and lives are transformed through service and proclamation of His gospel. Our Wednesday seasons of prayer and Bible discovery classes will empower and equip you to serve the Lord. But that's not all. We have dozens of ministries to meet the needs of White Rock members in the surrounding community. Our ministries for children, teens, women, men, and couples enrich the lives of those inside and outside the church. 
White Rock Ministries provide food to those in need, support those dealing with life challenges and grief, and create opportunities to discover and grow in God's collective purpose for our lives. For specific details on our ministries, prayer times, and Bible studies, please visit www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again as we persevere in the faith.
Somebody came to worship him on this morning. You deserve the glory and the honor. You deserve. You deserve the glory and the honor. And the honor. I lift my hands in worship. I lift my hands in worship. And I bless your holy name. And I bless your holy name. You deserve the glory. that God has done for people in here that they can wave their hand and say, Lord, it's nobody but you that has done a wonderful thing. And it's because of you that I can walk into your house and give you thanksgiving and tell you, Lord, how great you are, how wonderful you are. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we thank you that you're so great to us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you do miracles, Lord. And Lord, as we come into your house to worship you and to give your name praise, Lord, we ask you, Lord God, that you remove all the distractions that might be in our minds, Lord. Remove anything that, that, that will hinder your spirit from, from flowing in a free way, Lord. And God, we give you honor and praise because it belongs to you. And Lord, we thank you on this day for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Please remain standing, if you will. We're about to sing unto the Lord. 
we came into the house of God to worship today. Is that right? One of the reasons why we lift up hymns is because hymns are rooted in the Word of God. They are rooted in Scripture reason why the church must always remember the hymn is because it is not just a fleeting thought of a lyricist, a person who may have a good idea, but it's rooted in the Word of God. Can you say rooted in the Word of God? So when we got get ready to sing today, I want to read to you a, a passage of Scripture on which the hymn of the morning is, is based. In Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, here's the testimony of a man named Joshua. The word he writes in verse 45 of chapter 21 of Joshua are these. Not one of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. That's what Joshua wrote. And, and so the, the reason for the singing is to affirm that the promises of God are sure. That the, the promises of God are, are complete and the promises of God you can stand on. That's why we're standing on the promises of God. It's hymn number 373. I'm going to read the, the verses. I'm going to ask the, the person to put these words of hymn number 373, standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promise of a Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love's strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit sword I'm standing on the promises of God and lastly standing on the promises I cannot fall listening every moment to the spirit's call resting in my savior as my all and all. I'm standing on the promises of God. You know, when I was growing up in church, we used to have Sunday school, and in Sunday school, we always had to sing a hymn. And I was a 12-year-old singing, standing on the promises of God. And now I'm well past 12, and I'm still standing. Do I have any witnesses in this house? Are you standing? Come on and let's sing together. I'm standing on the promises of Christ. We're going to sing each stanza followed by the refrain. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages let his praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises.
Look at your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seen. Amen. That's a perfect segue to the next part of our service because now is our June birthday recognitions. And uh, those of you who have a birthday, we would love to stand and, and, and honor you and sing happy birth to you and sing happy birthday to you on today. So if you have a June birthday, would you please stand so we can sing happy birthday to you? Amen. Amen. Happy birthday to you. out, touch the person next to you as we sit together and pray prayer intercession. Jesus said, this house shall be called the house of prayer. Whatever else some have tried to make the place where God's people gather. Whatever else they've tried to make it, it is not a place where God abides unless it's a house of prayer. Why? Because God is a God who inclines his ear to his people. He hears our prayer answers our prayers in ways that benefit us puts our enemies to flight he heals us affirms us he elevates us more importantly he saves us I want those people to come in let them come in I, I know they're out there they want to come in and receive prayer You want God to bless your household. You want God to bless your friends. You asking God to be with you as you go to your various places of employment. If you're retired, you want God to make these retirement years your best years. Oh, there's a whole lot to pray about, isn't it? And I could go on and on. 
And that's why God says when you come to this house, it's a house of prayer. It's a house where God inclines his ear to us. Has anybody here ever had a prayer answered because you came to the house of the Lord? Come on, don't fool me now. If you... I'm going to talk about that a little later today. It's more than just going to church. It's more than that. It's entering into the place that's set apart for worshiping God. The Lord's Day is unlike every other day of the week. This is the day when we prioritize our worship of God over everything else. Because when we don't have God operating in our lives, we are miserable people. And oh, we put on a, a face. Somebody say mask. Somebody knows that they go through life with a mask on. How you doing? I'm doing fine. But underneath the skin, there's despair, defeat, anguish. But when you keep coming to the house of God, he removes the mass. He gives us a makeover where we're real and all the artificiality in our life is removed. We become genuinely children of God because we know what God will do. I just feel like praising him right now. I feel like shouting right now. Because he's sure enough a good God. And that, that didn't sound like I got a, a real big education, did it? But I can't help but say it like I mean it. Sure enough. Doesn't sound like somebody with a doctoral degree, does it? But I learned how to say sure enough. He's sure enough a good God. I'm a witness. You are too. Every head bow, every eye closed. God, we thank you for giving us the power, the strength, the desire to be in this holy place on holy ground on a holy day. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit in this place. I feel your presence in here because your people came to seek your face, to ex have an experience with you today. Let your word live for us. Bless us, inspire us, strengthen us, Save us. Save us from the hand of the enemy. Shine the light into the darkness. God, you are so wonderful, and we are so thankful. Thank you, thankful for your mercy, because your mercy is everlasting, and your truth endures unto every generation. We thank you for every blessing. Sometimes, God, we didn't even know we were being blessed. But your grace is sufficient. And for that, we thank you. Thank you for loving us. Even when we, we're not mindful enough to love ourselves, you rescued us, snatched us out of the hand of the enemy, cured us of diseases, broke addictions, blessed us with strength and power, and given us peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. You minister to our spirits, and we thank you. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the place where we gather to worship you. And while we pray, we're mindful of those who need healing this morning. We don't call their names today, but we know you are aware of every person who needs a touch of healing for you. 
Your word tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We especially pray, pray for those who are of the household of faith, name by name, condition by condition. Bless these saints that were part of this congregation and bless all of those who belong to your church throughout the nation and the world. We got a whole lot of problems that need to be addressed. But I know, God, in the name of Jesus, we can be and will be delivered. Save the nation. Save our city. Save our people. Oh, God, let the blood of Jesus be upon us and cover us and blot out our transgressions. Heal us, deliver us, and lift us. So that when we leave this place today, we can say, surely, the Lord was in this place, ministered to my soul, blessed me, strengthened me, and gave me a reason to run on to see what the end will be. Thank you for eternal life that is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. In his name, in the name of Jesus, we pray and say, Amen. Good morning, White Rock. Good morning. Our scripture for this morning found in 2 Kings chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and it reads Hezekiah had asked Isaiah what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me that I would go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now Isaiah answered this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather have it go back ten steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back the ten steps it had gone down on the stairway, of Ahaz. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy and mighty word. Thank you. 
had to look back behind me. I thought there were 35 folk back there. <laughs> Give God praise for these musicians and this choir. We thank God for them. Brother T.J. Bridges is doing a wonderful job. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, since, since you're in a good mood for applauding, I want you to give some love to the Everlasting Love Band. Stand up, band. That's the Everlasting Love Band. Pastor, how did it get a name like that? One, one evening we had a couple's ministry, I believe it was Valentine's <laughs> dinner downtown, and uh, this band was playing, and, and they played some of my, my stuff from uh, Barry White. Oh, you know who Barry White is. Oh, oh, baby, can't get enough of your love. And so, as Brother Little, he named the band or something and, and turned around. I said, man, y'all need a name, like Everlasting Love. And that's when they got the, the name Everlasting Love. I mean, whatever frame you want to put it in, that's what it is. We're blessed to have such a wonderful group of uh, people. <laughs> these singers, these singers are faithful. Give them a hand. They're faithful. I want to remind you, we're in the summer months, and for those who did not get the memo, we're in what we call casual Sundays, and we, we said that it's fine to dress casually, but don't dress like you're headed to the beach, but be comfortable and, and, and come on to worship. Don't, don't let the summer months, now some of us are just, you know, prone to have a little more dress up. But that's fine. Nobody's going to turn you away at the door if you got a, die, a tie on. We love ties and be beautiful dresses and pantsuits, etc. But we are in casual Sunday through uh, the week following Labor Day, just for a reminder. And on each Wednesday, uh, particularly uh, during these summer months, we remind you we still have our noonday prayer as well as our 6 o'clock prayer led by our own uh, deaconess, Fannie Meekin. She's done a wonderful job with our prayer ministry. <laughs> and at 7.10 on Wednesday, we have our Bible discovery uh, led by our associate ministers in a six-week course. We started out this past Wednesday in the book of Nehemiah. A wonderful introduction by Dr. Perry. And I encourage you to uh, log on or listen to, be part of, participate in our Wednesday evening activities because they're vital to your spiritual development and growth. One might ask, well, Pastor, how do, how do I get that information? You can always watch the screens for information prior to worship, or you can call the church office, and certainly we'll share with you the link on how to uh, become a part of our Wednesday uh, ministries. So we thank all of you for uh, your attendance and these ministers for their work. And we thank God for the ministry of the White Rock Baptist Church. Amen. You heard the scriptures read. I'll read a portion again, chapter 20 of uh, Second Kings, which is probably very familiar to many of us where at verse 8, and this is just a portion of, of this 
wonderful story. Hezekiah, it asks Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the house of, to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? This message today is intended to encourage somebody. The message title is God will give you a promise and sign. God will give you a promise and sign. Life is filled with a series of pivotal personal moments. You and I will face events that are often life-altering because they will either uh, distort our perspective about the future or they will strengthen our faith in God. I think everybody here who's lived long enough now will share with younger people that there are going to be many times in life where you're going to find some what we call pivotal events in your life. Those events are either going to cause you a great deal of despair or those events are going to strengthen your trust, your faith in the Lord. Hezekiah was one of those people. Unlike us, he had a much more serious event that challenged him in life. The reason I say that is because I see people freaking out over kinds of events that they think is a disaster in their life. You know, they heard there's going to be a great layoff where they work. Or they've been fired from their job and they got a family. Or they're working, but they can't hardly make ends meet. They're thinking about bankruptcy. Or something has happened in your life that is threatening to your own well-being. Hezekiah will tell you that things like that will happen in your life. But he has something much graver that occurred in his life. When you read the text, you'll discover that Hezekiah has received troubling news concerning his health. The man of God, Isaiah, the prophet, makes his way to the king's palace and he says to the king, the Lord told me to tell you to set your house in order. Set your house in order because you are about to die. We don't know what that illness was. Hezekiah wasn't feeling well. He saw symptoms. He had signs that something wasn't right in his body. He didn't know what it was. But now the man of God, Isaiah, tells him, God said, set your house in order. Get your affairs straight. Write your will. Determine where you're going to be buried in the king's burial ground. Set your house in order. Well, imagine what Hezekiah must have felt when he heard those words. His heart sank. The dread you could see in his face. The anguish, the despair, the disbelief. He's stunned. Have you ever faced a problem?
personal crisis that causes you to be fearful. Things that happen that just simply came out of nowhere, all of a sudden. You thought things were going okay, and then you get stunning news. Somebody's afraid to answer that. Isaiah had this news. Set your house in order. He's fearful. The prophet has spoken. But notice within a relatively short period of time, God changed his mind concerning Hezekiah. If you notice, if you have your Bibles with you, I tell people each time when they read the Bible, you have to understand the writers who often gives us clues about time and change in time and circumstances, events, etc. Sometimes marked by a darkened numeral or some indicator. And, and in this text, you'll notice in chapter 20, verse 2, 4, 6, and 8, there may be darkened numerals in your Bible. That's why I asked you to bring Bibles because it's an indicator that these things didn't happen just in uh, one thing after another right away, but there's a, there's a stretch of a moment in time. Isaiah tells Hezekiah, God said, set your house in order. He has despair. He's stunned. He's fearful. He's anxious. He has anguish and Isaiah is walking away but as he's walking away God changes his mind what can look fatal to us is only optional to the Lord You get news sometimes and you say, oh, that's it. That's the last word. But somebody needs to know with God, that's just optional. Yeah, in this story, Hezekiah's fear was reversed and changed into faith, all because God ends up giving him a promising sign. You know, Jesus, his strong appeal in the Bible, his strong appeal, particularly in the people in the New Testament era, was that people believed in him because he became known as the great physician. You know, Jesus is the healer. He's the great physician as they came to know him because he gave people hope because of all of the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed. When Jesus showed up, people believed that whatever was going on in their life could be handled, that God was present when Jesus showed up. In Mark chapter 1, the Bible says even Simon Peter's mother-in-law, one of his disciples, was in bed with a tremendous fever. She was suffering terribly in Mark 1. Peter's mother-in-law thought maybe she was going to be a person who was experiencing her last day. And then they told Jesus about it. And the Bible says that he went in 
to her and laid his hands on her and helped her because Jesus touched her, her fever left. And by evening, the word got out. People brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town came to Simon Peter's house, and Jesus healed. And I like the way the Bible puts it when you read Mark 1 and talks about Jesus and the healing. The Bible says he healed many with various diseases. In other words, the Bible doesn't try to name everything that Jesus can heal. The Bible said I take up too much pages, too many pages. If I had to tell you all the kind of things that Jesus could lay his hand on and heal. Do I have a witness in here? The word got out about him all across the land. They began to say, this man named Jesus can heal things that cause long paralysis or diseases they didn't even know what to do with. And across their, his earthly life, people brought their illnesses to Jesus and he healed them. God, what I'm trying to tell somebody is that God's authority works through him. That's why we put on the wall of the church in Jesus' name. Because in Jesus' name, healing, signs, miracles, and wonders happen all because of him. There ought to be a better praise than that. If anybody here has ever been healed through the name of Jesus, you ought to wave your hand right now and say, Pastor, you don't have to convince me. I know he's got the power. Yes. Before Isaiah was able to leave the king's residence, God directed the prophet, told him to turn around and go back. Return to Hezekiah with good news. In other words, God sent his word. Oh, there's power in the word of God. God sent his word. Sent his word and told Isaiah to tell Hezekiah, God is going to extend your life 15 years. Oh, I said to you a little while ago, set your house in order going to die and not live, but then something changed his mind, and God said, go back. Somebody say, go back. And tell him, I'm going to extend his life. And I'm going to tell somebody right now, God is no respecter of person. This man, Hezekiah, is a king. Doesn't matter how many degrees you got, no matter what your, your bank account is, no matter where you live. You are subject to the same problems and the things that happen to everybody else. But God, but God, but God, God has a way and a reason for changing his mind. So when I listen when I read the Word of God, when I, when I pick up the Bible, when I read the Word of God, when I spend time in the Word of God, I begin to wonder, are we taking the Word of God seriously enough? And are we able to open the Bible and study it long enough to raise the question, is it possible even today in our modern time to find out that whatever an initial thought is about a situation going on in our life or a condition that we have is really something that God will alter in your faith. When I read the Bible and I said, well, this is what God does with Hezekiah. I thank God he, he did what he did with Hezekiah, but will he do it for me? I mean, it wouldn't be in the scriptures if it were not possible. Do I have a witness in here? I mean, God would not ink it. 
through the Holy Spirit. God would not offer false promises. But God said, I put it there. Not so that you would have a distorted view of the future, but I want to strengthen your faith. Is this something God would do for me? Are you willing, God, to alter the outcome? Isaiah told Hezekiah about this fresh news from the Lord. <laughs> but, but Hezekiah, but Hezekiah, when he got the news, wanted a sign. I hear what you're saying. I heard what you said. I know what you said. I know you said God said that he going to heal me, give me 15 more years. But I want a sign. Some people may be a little disturbed by Hezekiah's response, but no, I ain't mad with Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, now we're talking serious stuff here. We're talking about my life. Isaiah, you came to me just a few moments ago. You said the Lord told you to, to tell me, set my house in order. Now you come back a short time later and say, God going to give me 15 more years. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. Give me a sign that God will keep that promise. And you know what? Hezekiah is not off base. Hezekiah knew scripture. Hezekiah knew that when you're facing something that is daunting and you're really not sure, you're hoping but you're not sure, you, you don't have to be afraid to ask God for a sign. You know, Hezekiah said, remember Gideon? If Isaiah had challenged what Hezekiah said, then Hezekiah would have been lying and said, in line to say, listen, you remember Gideon when God told him to take out the Midianites, reduce his forces? He said, listen, if that's you, Lord, and not just wishful thinking, give me a sign. <laughs> give me a What's the sign you want? I'm going to put a fleece on the ground. And, and, and the fleece, I want the rain, the dew rather, to come down, and I want the ground to be wet, the fleece be dry. As a sign that you are going to give me the victory. <laughs> Next day, Gideon picked up the fleece, fleece is dry. You think that would be enough? No, Gideon said, now, I, that's good. But just so that we're sure, because you're talking about 300 versus Thousands where our lives will be snuffed out. Give me a sign so I won't put their fleece back down on the ground. And next time I want to see the fleece wet and the ground be dry. And God did it. So Hezekiah said, well, I'm in order. I'm going to ask God for a sign. If you read verse 8 through 11, Hezekiah asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple on the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, this is what the, the Lord signed to you, that the Lord will do what he said he'd promise. Let me ask you something, Hezekiah. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps? Or shall it go back ten steps? It's a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back ten steps. Because you see, in those days, the way people really measured time was by the sun. Sometimes, you know, people get all confused about how to count days and how to tell time, and we think things have always been as they are today. I ask you now what time it is, and you will do this. You'll say, hey, Siri, 
what time is it? Or you'll just touch your watch and you don't even have to read the little hands, the minute hand or the hour hand. You just look at the digital time. No, they didn't have watches. They didn't have big clocks, all the mechanisms. All They told time and measured time by the movement of the sun. From morning to noon to evening, and they counted days and time by the movement of the sun. And they had what is called in those days a sundial. But in this case, they were in the portion of the palace where there was the steps of Ahaz. And so when Hezekiah was asking God or through his servant prophet Isaiah for a sign, he said, well, this is a sign. He said, well, tell me, what is the normal movement of the sun in time? He said, it always when it hits this building, the shadows go forward. So Hezekiah said, well, I'll tell you what the sign is. Make it go the other way. And the Bible says, then the, the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord. Oh, Lord, he has asked for the sign. Give him a sign that you are going to do as you promised. The Bible says, and the Lord made the shadow go back ten steps. Gone down the stairway of Ahaz. Hmm. You see, God has authority over time. See, we talk about nature. We talk about how God kind of puts things in motion and leaves it as it is. But what we need to recognize is the fact that God created life. In the beginning, God spoke worlds into existence, set the moon and stars in its place, as well as the sun and the whole story of creation. Creates us. And for God, what we realize is he has authority over time. When you read the Bible, you'll notice that God has time in God's own mind. Read the book of Joshua. Go there. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua's battle in a battle at Gibeon. And, and, and basically they're in a fight where the sun is going to set unless they've got more time. And the Bible says because Joshua was sent by God, God caused the sun to stand still and the moon to hold its time until God gave them the victory. So what were some things that moved God to extend this miracle of more life to Hezekiah? When I tell you God will give you a promising sign, you may ask me, well then, Pastor, what caused God to alter time for Hezekiah? Well, we can learn some things from this text. First of all, when Hezekiah got this initial news, remember that? When Hezekiah told him to set his house in order, you're going to die and not live. He had this dread. When he had this stun, when this remarkable news came to him, and he couldn't believe what God initially said, what did he did? Well, do. Well, the first thing he did was to get to his prayer place in order to make his appeal to God. The Bible says in verse 2, first thing he did was pray. You know, there are times when you hear that term, pray. You come to church a lot and you hear that same prescription, pray. Wednesday evening, you're going to have prayer meeting.
in your devotional life. One needs to develop a desire and a, a relationship with God through prayer. Hezekiah's first move upon hearing this dreaded information from the prophet was to pray. I told you those, those numerals were darkened and Hezekiah gave him the news. I mean, rather, Isaiah gave Hezekiah the news and he's on his way out. And when he leaves, Hezekiah goes into his room and he goes to this, what I call a corner of his room. And in that, in that corner, he, he's, 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 he's done and he tells the Lord in prayer, he says, Lord, remember. His conversation with God begins with, God, remember. Remember how I have walked, how I have lived before you faithfully with a wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. I asked the question, what is it? What is it? What is it? What caused God to alter time for Hezekiah? Well, Hezekiah prayed, and the first thing that came out of his mouth was, God, remember. You never know what you're going to face in life. It's always good to have an up-to-date relationship with the Lord, isn't it? It's, 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 it's all right to get in trouble and go to the Lord in a panic. No, we all have done it at one point in life, but it's much better to have a relationship with God where you can go to God in the time of your distress and say, Lord, remember. Remember how I walked and lived before you faithfully and done what is good in your life. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, I listen, what, his, what he doesn't do, he doesn't immediately send for the medicine man in Jerusalem. He's the king. He didn't immediately go and say, well, we'll go get my medicine man. The man just said, I'm going to die. We're going to see what we can do about this. That ain't what he does initially. Why? Because Hezekiah knows ultimately whether he lives or whether he dies is God's decision. I tell people all the time, you know, people want answers from me because I'm a man of God, I'm the pastor, I'm a minister, I'm a prayer for, and they want an answer from me. And I have to be honest. I say, all I can do is give this to God. I'll pray to God on your behalf. I'll be your intercessor. But ultimately... It's God's decision. He determines our time. God has his reasons to let us live. Or God has his reasons for taking us out of this world. But when our desire is to stay here, God will listen. Hezekiah said, God, remember how I've wholeheartedly been devoted to you done what is good in your sight. I want to live. His prayer place is in that inside corner of his house adjacent to the window, facing east toward the temple. And the Bible describes it as the wall. He turns his face to the wall. You may say, well, pastor, why does he turn his face to the wall? It's because the wall gives him focus. It doesn't allow his mind to wander. Thinking about other things and other circumstances, it helps him concentrate. Have you ever just had to turn your face to the wall? Wall. It would not allow his mind to be wondered. But there's something else. The Bible says in verse 2, not only does he focus in prayer, but he wept. He wept. This weeping is the tears. This is the deepest emotion of sincerity. You know, tears can move us. 
It's an indicator of sincerity. You ever have a child come to you and they give you a line, give you a reason, excuse, a purpose, desire, but won't do it, but the tears fall. You ever have a relationship with someone and you're questioning their sincerity? Because you've been deceived before. And I'm suggesting that some folk are not even able to bring forth false tears. But most of the time, when there's genuine contrition, godly so. When the wellspring of emotion has found that place of honesty and truth, he turns to the wall and he's praying to God, Lord, I've been faithful. Remember my devotion. I've been living right before you. Remember. And he weeps. I've served you with a whole heart. His tears. And so when God gave the explanation for the healing, why God altered the outcome, the Bible says, if you read verse 5, here's what God said. God said at verse 5, I have heard your prayers and I have seen your tears. I will heal you. God has compassion. What I'm trying to help you understand is that God is reading your heart. God knows your situation. He knows what you need even before you ask. But God is checking you. He wants to know how sincere are you in coming to me. I heard your prayers. I see your tears. And now God has compassion upon Hezekiah. That's why people love Jesus, because Jesus is one of compassion. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, when Jesus heard about the death of John the Baptist, he grieved by withdrawing to a solitary place by way of a boat. But the people followed him on foot around a long terrain. And when he saw that large crowd, the Bible says he had compassion on them and heal them. Heal their sick. Luke 7, as Jesus approached the town of gate at Nain, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother and his and she was a widow and a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. Dead man sat up, began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus' compassion extended that young man's life. Why? Because of his mother's tears. Matthew 20. 38 to 34, two blind men were sitting at the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was going by, they said, Lord, son of David, have mercy upon us. The crowd told them to be quiet, rebuked them, told them to be quiet. But they shouted even louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. He called them. He said, y'all shut up and let him come to me. He said, what do you want? Lord, we want to have our sight. The Bible says Jesus had compassion. Compassion on them. Touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight and followed him. Mark 1. I wish I had a Bible reading here. Verse 40 to 42. A man with leprosy, a deadly disease. We hear about all kinds of deadly diseases today. This man had leprosy. 
came to Jesus, begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. <laughs> Jesus, filled with compassion, doesn't matter what you got. If you go to him, I wish I had a praying crowd. No matter what your ailment is, if you go to him with sincerity, if you call out him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, if you go to him, these lepers said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out his hand and touched the man. He said, I am willing. I don't know nothing about your background, but I'm willing because you had the desire and you had the nerve to come to me and Get down on your knees before me and ask me. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. How many of you know he will carry you through? The Bible says he said, be clean. And the leprosy left him. God promised a sign to Hezekiah, but it was twofold. I'm almost finished now. The Bible says it was a twofold promise. He said, I'm going to deliver you and the city. You see, Hezekiah has shown faithfulness and trust in God under trial. King Sennacherib of Assyria had threatened God's people, Israel. But Hezekiah, king, of his people said, trust in the Lord, our God. He told them that before he got sick. When the enemy was mocking, Hezekiah was saying, trust in the Lord. How many times have you told other folk to do something? And realize why you telling them, you better believe it for yourself. When things look dire and dark and you seem helpless and weak, King Hezekiah was out there saying this, people, just trust in the Lord. You see, King of Assyria, Sennacherib, well, had a powerful army. He was destroying people all along the way. Others who had stood against him with their gods, small g, were falling one at a time. I won't read it all to you, but the Bible says that King Sennacherib began to mock God. You see, when he heard from his advisors, that King Hezekiah was telling his people to stay strong in the Lord. King Sennacherib was saying to Hezekiah's people, don't believe what your leader is telling you. Have you seen my power? Have you seen how I've destroyed one people after another. How many of you know that the devil will try to put that in your head? When something is happening to you, the enemy will show up and say what makes you think you're going to survive. When each one of them have died, haven't you seen what I have done with my verdict? on their life. So don't you turn to your God and think that your God can deliver you when others and their gods fail them. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. But Hezekiah had the kind of faith to tell his people to hold on. Because one thing God can't stand is an enemy who mocks his power. Oh, you don't hear me. Every now and then, God's going to
going to show up. And God is going to show out. Why? Because God want to show your enemy that he alone is sovereign. Your enemy will often try to discourage you and tell you not to stay strong in the Lord. So when God showed up, he sent him a promise through that same sign. God said, I'm going to do this for my sake. What are you talking about, Hezekiah? Well, God said, well, I'm going to deliver my people, and I'm going to save you. I'm going to extend your life. That sign that I sent was a sign that I heard your prayers, and I saw your tears. And I believe that you are sincere in your faith. Besides, God said, I got something to prove. Oh, you don't hear me. Come on now. Every now and then, God got something to prove. Do I have a witness? I know you and I are special in his sight. But every now and then, God will do something right. just for his name's sake. Yeah. I, heard, I heard. Yeah, I heard. I heard David say, I'm going to walk in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. I'm going to stand uh, on the promises of God for your name's sake. And even when I want to Bow down my head, I'm going to lift up my eyes unto the hill from whence cometh my help, because my help cometh from the Lord. Do I have a witness here? Is there anybody here who will testify the Lord is my light and my salvation? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Yes. Of whom shall I fear? In this, I'll be confident. Yes, I will. I'm going to inquire in the temple of the Lord. Yes, I am. And I'm going to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. God, how is this thing going to turn out? God said, tell your people everything is going to be all right. Yes, is there anybody here glad for a testimony that everything is going to be all right? Especially when God said, I'm going to do it because you've been faithful. I'm going to do it because I heard you pray. I'm going to do it because I see your tears. I'm going to do it because you've been faithful. I'm going to do it because I got something to prove to those who've been mocking you and mocking me. I'm so glad that I have a God who will show compassion. The Bible says there's just one stipulation at verse 5. On the third day from now, Hezekiah, you're to go up to the temple, go up to the Lord's house, dedicated to the worship of me. Go up there and stand there in my name. And when you get there on the third day, I'm going to seal it. When you show up in my house, I'm going to add 15 more years to your life. So, Hezekiah, three days later, went up 
to the house of the Lord. Is there anybody here who said I was glad when they said unto me, let's go up to the house of the Lord because your healing is in the house of the Lord. Your promise is in the house of the Lord. You get your strength in the house of the Lord. Your peace comes into the house of the Lord. Your confidence is coming from the house of the Lord. Yeah! Your faith gets built up in the house of the Lord. Well, in verse 7, Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of fix. And they did. And they applied it to the boil that was on Hezekiah. That was the only medical treatment that God sent that day. Well, God could have said, could have said, Hezekiah, be healed, be delivered, and be set free. But sometimes God said, I got a medical procedure. I got some medicinal things I'm going to do right now to assure you that I'm going to add to your life. Is there anybody here glad that God got many ways? of giving us an extension of our life. Well, I'm going to my seat now, but I'm here to tell somebody that's what Jesus did for you and did for me. He applied something to our life to give us more life. As Hezekiah had a poultice of fix put on his boil. But oh, Jesus applied his blood. Yes, he did. He applied his blood. He covered us with his blood. Is there anybody here covered in the blood of Jesus? Is there anybody here that's got the blood of Jesus? on you right now extending your life yes yes the blood of Jesus is giving me more life it reaches to the highest mountain the blood of Jesus if you're low low it goes down to the lowest valley it's the blood that gives me strength from day Today and it will never. Can I hear somebody say it will never uh, lose its power? There's power, 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 yes, power in the blood of Jesus. Oh, I'm not through with this passage yet. I see Isaiah picks it up where the kings left off. I'm going to close on Isaiah 38. Isaiah said, that ain't all. That ain't the end of the story. When I applied the fix to Hezekiah's boil and the healing came and the extension of the life came, Isaiah said, that ain't the end of the story. Isaiah wrote it down. Here it is in the 38th chapter, verse 17, in the memoirs of Hezekiah. Hezekiah wrote it down. Verse 17, Hezekiah said, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish in your love. You kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. And the pit, I can't go down there because there ain't no hope for the faithful. 
the living, yes, the living, the living, they praise you. That's what I'm doing today. Hezekiah said, Father, tell your children when the Lord heals you, go to the house of the Lord, lift up your voice, and give God a praise. When God heals you, don't sit there with your mouth closed. When God delivers you, don't just cross your arms and fold your legs. God said, open your mouth and say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Is there anybody here who's ever been delivered? Is there anybody in the White Rock Church who's ever had their life extended? Is there anybody here who's ever been healed? Is there anybody here who has more life? Let me hear you say yeah. Yeah. I'm a witness. Yes, I am. I'm a witness. He'll fix your heart. Yes, he will. I'm a witness. Some have died on the table. But I, here I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he extended my life. Is there anybody here who's ever had their life extended? Is there anybody here where the doctors say, I can't do no more. But God, oh, but God said it's not over yet. I said, is there anybody here who's ever heard God say it's not over yet? Is there anybody here who's heard God say, I am going to live for you. Lord, give me a sign that everything going to be all right. Yeah! 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 Oh, yeah! Yes, he will! 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 I can't wait to get to the house of the Lord and throw both my hands in the air and say hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you God, if nobody else will praise you, I'm going to praise you because you've been good, I thank you God, thank you for my life, thank you for my strength, thank you for my goodness. Thank you for my blessing. Thank you for my goodness. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my wealth. Thank you for my peace. And thank you for my joy. 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 There are some things
His love for me is like pure gold. I want to extend an invitation to discipleship to Jesus. Jesus is a compassionate Savior. If your soul needs deliverance from the grip of the enemy, the enemy has tried to destroy you discourage you. God sends you a word, a sign. I'm going to save you. Send his son Jesus. Send a word to you. The Lord sends a word to you. I'm going to deliver you. Hezekiah said, Lord, remember. Remember my devotion to you, my faithfulness. God said, I see your tears. I hear your prayer. And for my own name's sake, I'm going to show the enemy I alone have all power. I'm going to extend your life. 
I'm going to deliver you out of trouble. I'm going to bless you and your people because I am the Lord. If you're, day, if you're here today and you don't have a church home, if you're not in a community of believers, I want to invite you to become one with us, a Christian congregation, White Rock Baptist Church here in Durham, North Carolina. There are miracles all over this place. Thank you for joining our worship experience. We look forward to seeing you again online next Sunday or in person at 915 in our sanctuary at 3400 Fayetteville Street, Durham, North Carolina. For information about White Rock Baptist Church, please visit our website at www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org or contact the church office at 919-688-8136. Until next time, may Christ Jesus continue to bless you and keep you until we meet again.